Okay, let's go to section 102 and 104. Um, 102. It's going to get your students way excited when you teach 102 because it's the establishment of the High Council! <laughs> um, 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 um. Uh, yeah, this is the Constitution of the High Council. Now, as bad a rap as High Council sometimes gets, uh, one of the geniuses of the church government system is this system of councils. Um, Joseph. From the beginning has been doing councils. They've been ad hoc councils up to this point, before section 102, meaning if they needed to talk about something, they'd gather together a group of others and they would talk, or a group of high priests, they would convene in conference. But uh, the church is getting complex enough that Joseph uh, felt the need that there actually be a standing high council to be able to uh, handle some of the difficult issues that were arising. So let's walk you through what happened. 17th of February, 1834. Approximately 60 members of the church gather at the home of Joseph Smith. That home was built uh, in Kirtland's, right across from the Kirtland Temple. Uh, in a special meeting, they called 12 high priests to serve as members of the high council in what was considered the very first state organized in this dispensation. First state high council. Um, there's another view of this house. Um, this is not a revelation, but it's based on a revelation. This is, uh, these, are, these are notes that were taken uh, as Joseph explained high councils. And then they said, Joseph, why don't you, after we take these notes, why don't you go over them again and make inspired changes as you feel? And he said, good idea. So, um, it's minutes from the meeting. And Joseph says, this is based on an ancient order of things. So he had a revelation. This is not the revelation, but there's a revelation behind this that is the impetus. So here's what they said in the meeting. Brother Joseph said that he would show the order of councils in ancient days as shown to him by vision. The law by which to govern the council and the church of Christ. Jerusalem was the seat of church council in ancient days. The apostle Peter was the president of the council and held the keys of the kingdom of God on the earth, and was appointed to this office by the voice of the Savior, and acknowledged it in it by the voice of the church. He had two men appointed as counselors with him, and in case Peter was absent, his counselors could transact business, or either one of them. The president could also transact business. With him. It was not the order of heaven in ancient councils to plead for and against the guilty, as in our judicial court, so called. Still touchy right now, as far as government helping us. Uh, but that every council counselor, when he arose to speak, should speak precisely according to evidence and according to the Spirit of the Lord. That no counselor should attempt to scorn the guilty when his guilt was manifest. That the person accused before the high council had the right to one half the members of the council to plead his cause, in order that his case might be fairly presented before the president, and that a decision might be rendered according to truth and righteousness. Brother Joseph said that this organization was an example to the high priests. In their councils abroad, it was then voted by all present that they desired to come under the present order of things, which they all considered to be the will of God. And so section 1 and 2 is the result of the minutes that were taken and then revised by Joseph. So it was a revelation that Joseph paraphrased, that they wrote down, and then they wrote the meeting minutes, and that's what we got. Yeah? Okay. Want to get into the content? How do these councils work? And it might be fun to have like a actually do like a mock trial in your class, like do a do a church disciplinary council for someone who like eats too much of the sack of bread or something, you know, minuscule, like or whatever. Uh, afterwards, it was found that Jeremy, when no one was looking, took fistfuls of the sack of bread after the sacrament meeting was dismissed, uh, as he was supposed to be a, dumping it into the garbage can. All right, so you know, don't make it serious. But <laughs> if you want to get your students into this, I think they have to do this. Um, so you teach the, teach the why and the, and the how, the how is where you maybe do a mock trial. Uh, the why of disciplinary councils, verse 2, is great, that's a good summary. What is the purpose of high council? Uh, of a high, a high council, uh, in this case, the very first high council of the church, setting the pattern for all of the uh, high councils of the church. What are they? To so handle the important, important, important difficulties. difficulties. There you go, that's it. To handle important difficulties 
who is the man in the corner of the 12 today? What do you think? High councils or counseling or counseling alerts? So, uh, so it was Elder Ballard. Um, these are the three kind of, uh, he talks about disciplinary counsel, which is what this is going to talk about. Um, some members ask why disciplinary counsel that? I think that's a great answer. To save the soul of the transgressor, protect the innocent, and safeguard the church's purity, integrity, and good name. Uh, these are some of the difficult, as you say, important difficulties that sometimes uh, we need to make sure we handle correctly uh, for these three reasons. Uh, yeah. What are examples of important difficulties that may need to be settled by the High Council? Elder Ballard says, here they are. Murder, incest, apostasy, that would do it. When a prominent church leader commits serious transgression, that would do it. A predator who might threaten other persons, yep. Repeated serious transgressions, or if it's widely, well, uh, widely known, if they're guilty of serious deceptive practices like fraud and stuff, dishonesty in business transactions, that would do it. Uh, you might hold a council, so these are all must hold a council, you might hold a council for all of those, holy cow. Right. So just soak that in. I think teenagers like to know about these things. And that's yep. up to yep. the discretion of the state president, right? Yep. Whether he yep. keeps it or sends it back to the bishop. Yep. So those are, that's the list. Um, now we talk about how. The how disciplinary cases. So 13 through 19 is kind of fun. So, uh, we get a, uh, so go with me, 13 through 18. Uh, if it's a hard case, so you have to first decide is this a hard case or a easy case. If it's a hard case, then what do you do? Well, if it's an easy case, what do you do verse 13? It is not two only of the counselors. Yeah. Shall speak All you need is two of the high counsel to help you out on that. If it's a difficult one, then you need uh, all 12. So you need six on one side and six on the other. So they actually cast lots in verse 12. Uh, I've never been on high council, but my, my buddy has been. Have you been on high council? Have you been during one of these? I was asked as a bishop's counselor to sit in on one because someone was missing. So in this state, he was telling me that they just took a number. Yep, you yeah. just go one way, odds go the other way. Yep, that's right there in verse 17. You just take a number. If it's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, or 12, you're on, you're on the behalf of... The accused. the accused. If it's odd number, then your uh, your job is to protect the interests of the church. Right? You're not accusing the accused, yeah. but you are uh, protecting protect the, the church's interest. Yeah, the good name of the church. Yeah. Right. yeah. I was, I'm just curious, what I mean, what would your, be your role in defending the cause, the case of the of accused, the church. Of, of, the of the accused, accused. Of the accused. Uh, make sure it? they're not unfairly treated. That's make sure right. that they are. That's right. So there have been councils. Our state president said he was on a council, and he told the uh, the high councilors to stop because they were being unduly um, unfair in what they were discussing awesome. with this man. That's the right thing. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Elder Ballard says uh, a disciplinary council begins with an opening prayer, followed by a statement of the reason for the council being convened. Members ask to tell in simple, general terms about the transgression to explain his or her feelings and what steps of repentance he or she has taken. The member may respond to clarifying questions from leaders, then he or she is excused. The leaders counsel together, pray, and reach a decision. Decisions of the council are to be made with, the, with inspiration. The council can reach one of four decisions no action, formal probation, dis, disfellowship, and or excommunication. Uh, then there is an appeals process. If you don't agree with the decision of the High Council, you can appeal uh, all the way up to First President. First President. Uh, if it's an award, it goes to the stake. If it's a mistake, then it goes to the First President. You're right from stake level to First President. Here's the very first disciplinary. It actually happened just uh, how many days later? February 17th. This is two days later. Okay, so two days later, they held their first disciplinary council uh, in, uh, in Kirtland. Was Brother Hodges. Brother Hodges arose and said that he saw his wrong. They followed this to the T. He never saw it before and he appeared to feel thankful that he saw it. He said he had learned more during this trial than he had had since he came into the church. He confessed freely his error and he said he would attend to uh, overcoming that evil, the Lord being his helper. Uh, prophets have talked about these as counsels of love. Brother Ballard talks about that. He mentions a woman who just felt uh, intense love like she'd never felt before. A former Relief Society president who 
made some bad choices and uh, they're in the midst of that. But that's how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a council of love. This is not uh, accusatory. It's a, they're trying to make an inspired judgment call on what's the correct course of action. What are those four actions? There's four possible outcomes. What's the correct one of this individual's case? Anyway, it's probably enough about that, but yeah. I think students are really and the council is seeking, mildly interested in it. The council is seeking the Lord's will. Right. They're not inspired. Like discussing, what should we do here? Yeah. They're not. That's not how Inspired decision on which of those outcomes should be the case. Good. All right, let's go to section 104. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to 103 in just a minute. 104. In the aftermath of the Missouri persecutions, uh, a few days before this revelation was given, as the, the Kirtland leadership got together, the uh, question about what to do with the United Firm happened. Like, the financial, uh, well, the ability of the uh, Missouri Saints to contribute anything to the firm was now zero because their property had been stolen and their printing press was destroyed and their dry goods store was demolished. So that aspect of the United Firm was no longer relevant. And certainly the Kirtland aspect of the United Firm could not produce enough money to help them out. Um, then, uh, in response to Section 101's parable about the young men rising up and going to help, they, they had begun thinking about uh, you know, if that was literal. And then Section 103, which we're going to talk about in a second, actually says, yes, Zion's camp is on. And so now they're like, well, that's going to be expensive to get a, uh, the members of the church, the, the strength of the church from Kirtland 900 miles over to Missouri. So they started doing fundraisers, uh, trying to get money gathered from the, the saints to uh, uh, finance that, that journey all the way to Missouri to help their, their uh, fellow citizens there, their fellow saints. And uh, Joseph was not super impressed with how many donations were, were given. In the midst of that, as they're going through this financial angst, this meeting was canceled. They, they said, what do we do? They decided to dissolve the United Firm. A few days later, that decision was verified here that, yes, that's the right thing to do. So now the United Firm goes from five in Missouri and six in Ohio uh, to United Firm in the city of Zion and the United Firm of the stake of Zion, the city of Kirtland. So Oliver comes down here, they remain the leaders in Missouri, and uh, they are now operating 100% totally independent of one another. Well, this one's operating, this one's not. But now they're independent, so this one's not affected directly by that. That's what Section 104 does. And some other things. That's a lot of things. It's, uh, he reiterates principles of consecration, 11 through 18. Um, this would be another one of those. So. If you ever make a covenant to keep the law of consecration that's found in the Doctrine of Covenants, what you want to do is you want to go through the Doctrine of Covenants and identify what those principles are as taught in the Doctrine of Covenants. It does not mean that uh, the, the various systems, like you're not going to be invited to go and participate in the United Firm or uh, in the consecration of property like they did with Bishop Partridge, uh, but the principles undergirding it, that's what you would be covenanting to obey, right? President Kimball, or President Benson said, you do covenant to do that in the temple, right? And so, here, here's a list of those verses you might look at, right? Section 42, section 51, section 70, section 78, section 104, 82, those are your sections that you're going to learn the law of consecration. Uh, my college students, I have them write a paper on the law of consecration as found in the Doctrine of Covenants. What is it? And what, is, what are the implications for us? So these would be some verses to look at. Um, verse 17, just want to make a note on verse uh, 17 here. Well, it's outlined some of this. I forgot that I outlined it. Um, so one is you're a steward over earthly blessings. You're accountable for your stewardship. I created the earth and all things are mine. The earth is full. There's enough to spare. Don't be stingy with your stuff. Help, lift, bless, strengthen. As far as the earth being full, I thought this was fascinating from President Nelson. He said, arguments swirl around that the earth is dangerously overpopulated and that couples should restrict the number of their children. Have you heard that one? <laughs> However, at the Fifth World Congress of Families in 2009, Sister Nelson and I heard a scholar present a paper in which he made a stunning statement. He said that if each man, woman, and child now living upon the earth 
were allotted a quarter of an acre of land, all 6.8 billion people would fit in the country of Brazil, with 20% of Brazil still left unoccupied. He said, does that sound like the earth is overcrowded? I checked that calculation. It is correct. <laughs> I adjure you to believe the Lord who said the earth is full and there is enough and to spare. <laughs> Not an awesome statistic. Uh, part of consecration is believing that and then being generous and, accept, and uh, accepting the generosity of others in the emulation of the Lord. Um, some others. Uh, I prepared all things for you, trust me that I am behind this. I provide for my saints by asking the rich to give from their stewardships to the poor. You are agents, but remember, if any shall take the abundance I have given them, and impart not to the poor and needy, they shall lift up their eyes in hell, being in torment. Mm -hmm. Blessed are the merciful, they shall receive mercy. And blessed are those who receive mercy, if they are then merciful. Like, let keep that cycle going. Don't plead for mercy and then give nothing. Uh, so those are all in those verses. Yeah. Um, so verse 18 says, and in part not his portion according to the law of my gospel. Yeah. What does that mean? Exactly? That's the only place in the scriptures where the phrase law of the gospel shows up. So if you ever covenant to obey the law of the gospel, uh, it is likely uh, in scripture that what it's talking about is this idea of being merciful and giving to the poor. That's uh, one scholar, Jack Welch, that's his take on the law of the gospel. Um, others have suggested maybe when Jesus says, this is my gospel, faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost, maybe that's what he means by the law of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of intention, I feel like. This is the only time that phrase comes up exactly. Uh, Sorry, what verse is that? Uh, verse 18. 18. So what's the portion according to the law of my gospel? Like, oh, there, I always want to know, how much is that? How much is that portion? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at this time, the law was what? At this time, at this they time, give everything, everything, and you receive back uh -huh. your stewardship, right? Uh, in our time, right? that's not the case. Right? In our time, you're being asked to give what? Ten percent plus. Generous, fast, generous, generous, whatever. Now you get to work on and struggle with generous. So the Holy Ghost can tell me what my portion is. Right, and time and talents that you're being asked to, to give. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. In this case, we're specifically talking about taking care of the physical needs of the poor and needy, but mm -hmm. you can generalize that as well. It's Church cons and stuff. Um, redistribution of stewardships. We won't take time to read all of that, but I'll just give you a quick little flyby. So this, there's the, there's a two treasuries that are created by this. There's a sacred treasury for the scripture printing funds that's going to like, be its own thing. And then there's going to be another budget line that's specifically for everything else. Um, yeah. Uh, there's, this is, these are pretty cool verses about why these scriptures are important. Um, why, why have a sacred treasury to print scripture? Check these verses out. This, I remember this kind of like just startled me when I first read them. Like, whoa, did he just say that? That's why we have the scriptures. Maybe this is why we have seminary that teaches scriptures. For this purpose, I have commanded you to organize yourselves, even to print my words. The fullness of my scriptures, the revelations which I shall, which I have given unto you, and which I shall hereafter, from time to time, give unto you. Why? For the purpose of building up my church and kingdom on the earth, and to prepare my people for the time when I shall dwell with them, which is nigh at hand. Hmm. That's why we have scriptures. We build the kingdom of God on earth in preparation for Jesus' return. So let's study our scriptures. Let's teach them effectively. Some counsel on debt. Uh, teach the teenagers. Maybe it's preventative counsel. What does the Lord teach about that? Those who desire to overcome debt. He's got a few things to say about that. 78 through 80, 82 through 83. Uh, he gives such, he outlines such principles as pay, pay your debts. Be humble. Be diligent. Uh, be prayerful. Again, humble, diligent, prayerful. Repeats it 79 and 80. Right? So that should tell us something. Uh, another, verse 82, humble, faithful, prayerful, call upon my name, I'll give you victory, he calls it victory. I give unto you a promise, you shall be delivered this once out of your bondage. You guys know the back to the aftermath of this. They prayed in desperation for some miracle to happen. Yeah. And what Tanner? happened? John Tanner, Tanner happened. Tanner. Yeah, then yeah. John Tanner happens. He shows up and pays the debts of the church, not a day too late. Um, so... 
specifically in context here, uh, that's a pretty awesome aftermath of them being prayerful, right? Joseph says, in the, in the movie at least, right? There is one thing we can still do. And they, uh, how often is prayer mentioned in this? Not the typical debt elimination program that you find out there, um, but that would be part of the diligence, right? Um, Elder Worthland, he shares this, of course, he teaches the principles about there are such, there are things that's okay to have uh, debt for. Uh, President Hinckley, the pattern of the church, he says, we just have two <coughs> principles. It's, here's our budget principles. Number one, we live within our means. Number two, we have a fixed percentage of our income that's set aside to build reserves against what might be called a rainy day. He says, for years the church has taught its members the principle of setting aside a reserve of food as well as money, take care of emergency needs that might arise. We're only trying to follow that same principle for the church as a whole. Uh, Elder Wortham gives these a bit of awesome not in there. So are we trying to improve upon the text? That was, uh, yeah, that's okay. That's fine. Uh, so modern prophetic counsel to add to section 1. Boom! The end of 102 through one, and 104.